Hello, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Valeria Romori, and I'm the director of the Italian Cultural Institute in Los Angeles. I would like to welcome you all to this webinar with writer Giulia Caminito. This event is organized by the Italian Cultural Institute in Los Angeles in collaboration with the Premio Campiello and the Clorinda Donato Center for Global Romance Languages and Translation Studies at California State University, Long Beach. On the occasion of the 21st week of the Italian language in the world, an initiative of the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation. Giulia Caminito, with her book, L'acqua del lago non è mai dolce, The Water of the Lake is Never Sweet, was the winner of the 2021 Campiello Prize, a prestigious literary award that has been presented since 1963. Today, she will be in conversation with Professor Clorinda Donato, California State University, Long Beach. In her brilliant book, Giulia Caminito tells the story of an uncomfortable, difficult reality, invisible to the majority of contemporary writers. Giulia Caminito was born in Rome and graduated in political philosophy. She made her debut with the novel La Grande A, The Big A, in 2016, Bacutta Prize, Berto Prize, and Brancati Youth Prize. Followed in 2019 by Un Giorno Verrà, A Day Will Come, Fiesole Under 40 Prize. And L'Acqua del Lago Non è Mai Dolce in 2021, one of the five finalists of the Strega Literary Prize 2021, a winner also of the Campiello Literary Prize 2021. Clorinda Lodonato directs the Clorinda Donato Center for Global Romance, Languages, and Translation Studies at the California State University, Long Beach, where she's professor of French and Italian. She's an author, scholar, and the 18th century who studies knowledge transfer through translation, gender, in medical and literary accounts, and multilingualism. After the conversation, between Professor Antonato and author Giulia Caminito, we invite you to ask questions used using the Q&A tool in Zoom. Finally, I would like to sincerely thank Giulia Caminito and Professor Donato for their invaluable participation today. Now, without any further ado, it is my great pleasure to present Professor Donato. Thank you very much, Valeria. First of all, let me say what a, an absolute pleasure it is to have been invited um, to moderate this webinar uh, by the director of the Italian Cultural Institute of Los Angeles, Valeria Rumori, thank you, because this is an important book. And I'm really pleased that so many colleagues, um, professors of Italian and students of Italian are here today because if you have not read this book yet, this is a book you want to read and this is a book that your students will definitely want to read. So let's turn our attention though to the author, Julia. You're not here to hear me, we're here to hear her. And um, I'd like her to maybe uh, begin by talking a little bit about um, a book written in the first person. So um, obviously one jumps to the conclusion of how autobiographical uh, it might be. She ends um, her book by telling us that it's a, a, a coming together of, of many ideas and uh, relationships that she had with many people distilled into this book. But the 10 years or so of the life of Gaia, whose name only appears once in the book, um, are really those profound years from about the ages of 13 to the age of 23. Um, over the, in the years of the, the 80s and 90s, um, in Italy. And um, Julia, maybe you could tell us a little bit about how this book came together for you. 
Hi, every, everybody. I'm so sorry because my English is not the best. So I'm, I'm going to try and Clorinda is going to help me. So <laughs> I'm so happy to be here. I really appreciate everything about this evening. And I'm so glad for your invitation. Um, I hope in the future to will be at the Italian Institute of Culture in, uh, in Los Angeles, maybe. Fingers crossed. And um, this book is my third book. Um, the other two books are novels about um, some uh, stories uh, about my family. The first one, La Grande A, is about uh, my grandmother and my grand grandmother's story uh, in the period, post colonial period, uh, in Eritrea and Ethiopia. Uh, during the 50s and the 60s. So I work uh, about my grandmother memories uh, and I was trying to, um, um, to talk about uh, a subject that is not so uh, considered in Italy. Uh, and this is the period uh, of colonialism in, uh, in, in Africa. And I was thinking about my family and I was thinking about why they were there and uh, questions like that. The second novel is about another part of my family and uh, is about anarchism in, in Italy uh, and at the beginning of the 18th centuries and 18th century. And it's about my grand grand father who was um, an anarchist in Le Marche, which is a really uh, small region uh, in the center, center part of, um, of Italy. Uh, after these two novels about the past of our country, about my family, I was, I was just wondering, what, what can I do next? Uh, I, I want to be just an historical writer. Uh, I, I want to talk about past or I, I want to try to talk about present. Uh, I want to talk about um, these years and how can I do that? Um, and then I decided to do something that I was not uh, used to and I was a, a little bit afraid talking in first person and talking in present because Everything that I written before um, was written in past tense and uh, in the third person uh, because because I was I was really I don't know I really appreciate uh, I I was confident in that position as a writer I was really confident uh, and I was feeling myself in that position and I want to turn everything upside down with this new novel. Uh, so I decided about uh, the first person and the, and the present time. And it was difficult at the beginning. I was starting to write and I, I was looking at the page and I was writing in past tense. And every time I was like, Julia, what are you talking? What, why? Why, why you, you, you just come back to, to, to the past and you don't want to talk in the present? So I forced myself and I decided to put together two stories. Uh, two or three stories, but two main stories inside this book. I, um, I, I wanted to talk about a girl, a little girl and then a girl and then maybe a woman. And I, wa I, want, I want her to be violent. I want her to be aggressive. I want her to be, um, to be angry about herself, about her future, about her family. And I want her to be poor. I want her to be in a in a difficult economical situation, but in in the, in the nowadays today, I want a family that was affected by the economical crisis today, and I want her to be uh, ashamed of it, and I want her to be angry and mad and to be aggressive in a very physical way. And on the other hand, I used a lot of things about my life because uh, uh, the novel takes place in the lake of Bracciano, which is, which is the place where, uh, where, I where I lived all my childhood and, my, uh, and when I was younger. And then I decided to put something about myself inside the book, but to use myself. It's not a book about me. It's a book about a young girl and, and particularly about a young girl 
in this uh, in this era about uh, con consumismo about consumerism consumerism and about her family and her relationship with her mother her mother is another important figure inside the book and maybe we, we will talk more about Antonia, uh, but the, the idea at, at the beginning was I have myself, I have this girl and I want a voice for her. And then I want a family and I want a mother. Um, Antonia is a woman and she's struggling for the public house assignment for a family because they are, uh, she has uh, four kids and one husband, husband and, and he can't work anymore. She, he was um, a carpenter, carpenter is right. Uh, he was a carpenter and he had an accident at work and now he can't work anymore. So she, uh, she has uh, an hus husband uh, that is not an husband anymore in the, in the classical way that we think uh, in Italy, especially about men in the society and inside the family. Uh, and she has four kids and she hasn't uh, really house for them, for them because they are struggling for the assignment. And so she's struggling. She, she's, the, um, she's really fierce and she's, um, she's really powerful, but she's over powerful some, for her daughter. So there are, this was the, um, the first, uh, first ideas that I came, that, that I came with. And I, and I want to talk about all these elements. I want to talk about Italy nowadays. I want to talk about angry in really young people. I want to talk uh, about housing problems in Italy. And I want to talk about families and the women in families. And all these things together um, are at the beginning of, of this novel and about what I was talking about, thinking about. Oh, right. clear. In fact, in fact, the, 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 the gender issues are really quite astonishing. And uh, one of the ways in which this very um, a, a powerful and aggressive mother is able to consolidate her power is through the disability of the husband, who you describe as being a having a voracious sexual appetite. But the accident means that he can no longer function sexually, and Antonia is free from future pregnancies, even though she ends up with a set of twins. Um, um, uh, uh, she's pregnant um, be before uh, the husband is um, disabled. But this consolidates her power in a in a in a very interesting way, and. Um, but but one of the things I was astonished by at the end is that her male son, Mariano, so Mariano is very important for Gaia, for the, the, the young girl in the story, in the story who's picking up her mother's power as things go on. But um, Mariano is estranged from the household. But then, he becomes the hero. And I'm wondering how that happened. How did a male become the hero again in this story at the end, saving the family, giving them back their house? Well, I was, um, um, in my first book and in this third book, I have two very, two couples of uh, really strong women. And then in the second book, I have a couple of two uh, young men. And one of this young man was Lupo, the wolf. Uh, he was an anarchist. And uh, he is uh, the character that I really love the most um, in all the characters that I, that I wrote all these years. And, um, and I was thinking about Lupo because in the second novel is a novel about uh, utopia, uh, about fate, about politics. 
uh, about future, um, about war, um, and all the things that happened in Italy and not just in Italy during during that those years. Um, and he's a really hopeful um, uh, novel, even if I'm talking about war and then I'm talking about the Spanish flu and the epidemic during those years, is his, it's, it's a really um, full of positive um, meanings for me. And I was thinking, what, what can Lupo be in the contemporary years? What an anarchist, someone uh, whose life is so connected to politics, is so connected with the public life and with the movement and with the other, other people. Uh, he, he, is, he has a really strong sense of justice, not just for himself, but for his community. Uh, what about this kind of character in a contemporary field, in a contemporary space. Um, and, and, and this is why Mariano is inside this book, uh, because I want uh, a really political figure uh, inside the book. And I know that I had two big female inside the book too. And, and I don't want the message that uh, female uh, are better than, than males, that uh, future is just for female. Uh, I think that uh, novels have to be, I don't know, I don't want to teach something. I want to open things. I want to make questions. And that's why you have two females that are so difficult um, they are so uh, difficult to understand sometimes. Gaia, the main character, she is so angry and so aggressive, and sometimes she's so frustrated that, that, that the reader sometimes can ask himself, why? Why she is like that? Why she, she can't just rest and be in peace, just think about things? And on the other hand, I have this male character, which is Mariano, and I want him to be important. I want him with his vision of life, about politics and about justice and about family and about future to be a little message inside the book. Uh, and, I want, and I want it to be carried by a male because I'm full of female characters in my books, I have to say. And I think that Antonia is a really big and strong and positive for my pros prospective character. So uh, because of the situation about the father, because he is so inactive inside the book, uh, is disabled, but it's not, it's not this that, that makes him this um, inactive, is his mindset. He's completely broken. Uh, he can't function in the right way. He can function as a father or as a carpenter or uh, as a lover anymore. So I want a, a male character with a message um, inside the book. This is why, because I was thinking about Lupo and I was thinking about anarchism and I was thinking about the past that is so important in Italian history that is not so studied, the period before Mussolini, the period uh, at the beginning of the century and before Mussolini is so important in the political history of Italy, but it's not so studied. And I was continuing thinking about that period and I was looking outside today at our political situation and I was so angry and I was so frustrated that I want this message inside the book. Um, well, one of the things, if I could interrupt you for a second, that's absolutely um, um, striking about your book is the way that you did weave in um, uh, um, contemporary history. For example, Mariano, who goes to Genova uh, for the G8, right? And that very fateful moment. Um, and the uh, one of the things I found so um, incredible about the book that consolidates in many ways Antonia's power is that she goes to Genoa to get her son. She has, a, it's, it's interesting, she has a sense that his ideals about anarchy are going to be completely 
destroyed by the experience that he of the G8, and it is. And to me, he comes back, that, that I found sort of surprising because to me, he seemed, it was sort of like the, the, the failure of anarchy, the failure of politics to uh, create a space where young people um, could have agency. He comes back and his, his agency has been taken from him from a situation in which this kind of political um, 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 uh, protest has been eviscerated. And I was wondering if you could say something about that because I see him as his political agency is taken away from him, which seems to me to be very much uh, a commentary on what's going on today, that it's almost impossible for young people to have the kind of political agency that we had in 68. And I, I speak as somebody from that generation um, and as the mother of people from your generation, um, and your um, book was so instructive to me about um, the way you see things and are feeling them. Yeah, I, I studied politics um, in philosophy on the theoretical part. And I was, I, 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 somehow I need to talk about politics in my books, somehow. And this is a book about a political way. The apolitical way that is so uh, present in Italy today, but not just today, but during the 80s and the 90s and the early, in the early 2000. Uh, so Gaia is, a, is completely, it's so far away from politics, from, from public life, from news, newspapers. Um, and so she's at, at this point. Then we have Mariano. Mariano is really interested in politics. She's interested about learning something more about the world around him, about his, his politics and history, about uh, what, what is going on in our, in our country, what is going on about young people, what we can change, what we can do. He is 17 and he's like, I'm against the power, I'm against, um, against uh, the G8 and I'm against uh, the global movement and I want to do something. And he has this greed inside of him. And like a lot of young men and women in Italy, during the, these years around the G8, which is a really important moment, uh, a really historical moment in Italian history of the, the, the contemporary part, because there is a pre uh, before, there is a before G8 and an after G8. So uh, I use the G8 inside the book uh, because Gaia and her friends are completely not interested about the event because it's just, oh, it's the G8, oh, what is this? I don't know, I'm, I want to see Dawson Creek at the TV and they will talk about uh, TV and shows and schools and they are, they are not interested in the, in the event. And uh, they are not making questions about themselves and about the world around them, um, not in school, not at home. And Mariano is there, is at the event. He decided like a lot of young people in Italy to go with, with trains during the night and, to, and, and they arrived in Genoa. And what they were, they were thinking that it, it would be a, um, a Pacific, uh, protest in in the reality in the reality it became like one of the most cruel um, protests in Italian recent history uh, and uh, a young man died during the pro during those days and it was so intense because we saw everything at at the TV that was the first time that I saw a young man die at the TV and it was Carlo Giuliani for the G8. So this is so big. And I decided to put just this, this is so big and I put it in three lines because I was, 
I, I was trying to talk about the after, what, what came after, what you were saying, Clorinda, that we sometimes somehow erase everything. It was like the, um, the breaking point of, um, of, of a society, uh, of a country, because we, we decided to be used to, to television, to Berlusconi, to all this um, discussion, discussion that were so low, so um, empty. Uh, there was empty politics after the G8. And, and Gaia is there. She's so young. She's not interested in anything that uh, other than herself. She's thinking about objects. She's thinking about uh, what she can afford. She's thinking about parties and she's thinking about uh, her friends and maybe she can have a boyfriend and maybe she can be as everybody else, but she has these economical problems in her family. She's thinking so much about herself. Well, well let, me, let me interrupt you here because I mean, I, I, I find Gaia an absolutely fascinating character because she is aware of her intellectual superiority to all of her friends. This intellectual superiority, she also uses as a, as a way to keep them distant. In fact, I never felt like Gaia really engaged with any of her friends. At the same time, as you're saying, she she does all of the things they do. She criticizes it. We're always listening to her inner monologue about how stupid it is, about look at what they're wearing now, but she's going along with it, which is really quite striking. Uh, and it's really brilliant the way you constructed um, this character so that we could see her inner monologue, but at the same time, we could see what she was going to use as her pathway out. And that was going to be her intellect and education. And so I'd really like to talk about that because if there's a hot topic today, very much in Italy, but also all over the world is what is the value of a university education? And what happens when a person like Gaia and her mother Antonia, I mean, they're completely invested in her intellectual success. What happens when that doesn't happen? She constantly, I just wanted to, there, this is a light motif throughout the book. She's studying to become someone, right? This was this is the mantra of my immigrant parents. I couldn't be somebody, but you're gonna study to be somebody. And she is fully believes that myth. And that is the tragedy of education today. And you put that in your book, the myth is no longer there. And um, she, she's critical of, of Elena who has no respect for language she continually stresses her belief in words. But it's fascinating that she doesn't make the connection between those words and the words of politics, that she doesn't make that crossover. She goes to the Liceo Classico. She's following all of the old myths about education. Yet when her dottorato di ricerca, her ability to do a doctorate is denied her, it's because she doesn't know German. Anyway, I'll let you um, uh, step in here because again, such a fascinating uh, female character and there's so much to say about her. Thank you for, for this question because the theme about the education is really central in this book for me. Because there is a really, I don't know how it is in the United States, I can talk just about Italy, but we have a really big problem about the falling apart of this big myth, which is you, if you, if you don't have anything, if your family is poor, 
If you don't have access to a lot of things, you can study and then you can learn and then you can be someone and then you have a role in the society. My family uh, believed in this. My grandmother believed in this. When my mother was the first child uh, of, uh, of the family who went to the university, she was the first and they were like, this is so big and so important. And then she started to work in the museums and in libraries. And that was so quick, like out of the university, inside the work, in the, the jobs and the work world. And right now this click is just gone. It's just not here. And you, you, I want university and studies to be a myth. I want them to have this aura to has this importance to have this opportunity to be so democratic to be uh, for everybody and to be open and to be um, uh, um, a look for the future uh, so i'm going to study and i'm going to be someone in the future this someone else that i like to be i want to be free because i want to study I don't know, right now I think that this thing is gone, it's completely gone, and I want to talk about it in this book, because one of the most important and read and, and, that, and read in all around the world book, novel, during the last years is uh, Elena Ferrante, my brilliant friend, and Elena Ferrante, which for me is one of our most important author in Italy, and I really appreciate her work and her importance all around the world. And she was talking about this mentality really, uh, really in, in a really classical and, uh, and, truth, and truthful way. She was thinking, she was talking about little girls that want to study, that um, they found out about books and they are so amazed and they want to study and their family, uh, their family uh, don't want them to study because want them to, to work, but they continue to study and, uh, and they success at some point, one of them, one of them success at some point. The way to go out from the ghetto, from, um, from the most poor area of the city of Napoli, the way to go out from the Rione is to study. If you study, you can go out from the Rione, you can go out in the world, you can be someone else, you can forget and forgive your past and your family and everything about Italy that it doesn't work. But right now it's not like that. And it's not like that for Gaia. She studied all the time during the book, all the time from where she's a little child and then her mother gave her a dictionary uh, so she can learn a lot of words and she can use them uh, in a different way from uh, her friends and she learned a lot of a lot of words and she's amazed about words and she read a lot and she studied a lot and nothing happened at some point the dictionary is, 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 is a fantastic moment in the book. It's the only moment where the mother and daughter bond and the, as they look at words together. And uh, the, this, is, this is such, it's the only time that she gets something new as well. It's the, the recognition, it's the recognition she was seeking uh, from her mother and symbolically it's transmitted by the book, but also a new book. It didn't belong to somebody else. It didn't. And you can see that. But as you say, and this is where I see this incredibly important generational difference between you and Elena Ferrante. For Elena Ferrante's generation, that still was a way out. That is not the case today. And that's why your voice is so important because what are we supposed to do with this education? The other thing that struck me so much about Gaia was that it didn't seem that she enjoyed anything she studied. There was no love or enjoyment there. And I was really struck by the phrase you say, 
she's with her friend who's reading Jack London, right? Who's enjoying the book and asking, um, asking Gaia for the definition of words. And she says, I was, I had been pretending for weeks that I was interested in the idiot by Dostoevsky. And I thought this, this was so, this pretending because she had to appear that she was reading a big 19th century author, but she was pretending to enjoy it. Yeah, I was, I was trying to do something that maybe not everybody can appreciate because you want a character in a book to appreciate books as you appreciate books. I don't know if, if this makes any sense, but a lot of people uh, told me that this was disrespectful, this was awful from my character because she she feels that she need to, to study, she need to uh, read the, the right things because her mother told her about this. She's like, you need to read good novels. You need to be better than me. This is the position about Antonia. You don't have to waste your time in magazines and stupid readings that are that are not, not going to help you to grow to grow up. You have to um, to be strong, and you have to um, to to understand which is so important. And you have to study, and you have to be patient, and you have to be solid in this. So she's like, I don't want to be uh, ashamed. Uh, I don't want to be. I don't want my mother to look at me as I'm a failure. I, I want to be the best in front of her because she's so strong, she can do anything. And what can I do? I, I, I feel like I'm a little girl in front of her, but maybe I can study because she, she couldn't. Antonia couldn't study because she, uh, she was pregnant, pregnant when she was really young uh, and so her life changed and her family was poor, so poor. And so she, she decided to, to work. Uh, and Gaia is like, she's taking all these things on her shoulders, all the future that Antonia is, is, is trying uh, to projectare su di lei. To project onto on, her. on her. So, um, and, and she's like, she, she, it's like, like she doesn't want us to understand and she likes books. She's like, I don't, I don't, it's not important. It doesn't matter. Uh, I'm going to read it, but I pretend to. Uh, but she's continuing this path. She's continuing to follow her mother's steps. And she's like, I'm going to study even if I want to cry. I'm going to studying the nights, I'm, I'm going to study in the bathroom, on the train, under the bed, over the bed, uh, inside the car. I'm not going to stop because at some point, if I pretend or if I continue, somehow I can be free outside this family. I can have everything that I want because with, with everything that I'm studying, I, I will be someone at, uh, at some point so um and and that's why she's so sarcastic about her relationship with books and words all through the book all through the novel um because i want her to be sometimes uh, um fastidiosa mm. fastidious but you fastidious know there's as a character thing, though, there's something though that is really um uh, uh, shocking in that all of this uh, studying and work that she was doing, the one thing she cared about was the proposal she makes to her, what, who, who the person, she, a man who she hopes will be the director of her doctoral uh, thesis. And she's completely off. She completely misses what would have been a viable thesis. And he tells her, no, no, that's not, everybody's done that. That's not a good thesis. And by the way, you can't do a doctorate and maybe you can go to Tor Vergata, go see them. And in, in a few sentences, her whole world just falls apart. 
And what was shocking to me is that she stopped fighting. Why? Well, at some point she's exhausted. She studied all these years and uh, she's like, she can't continue. This is just not, just not uh, something about Gaia. She's exhausted, she's frustrated. Um, but on the other hand, uh, the reason why I decided her to stop there is a social uh, reason. Because if you have, if your family has uh, some money, maybe you can continue to study even if you have not uh, um, Borsa di Studio, uh, Dottorato scholarship. scholarship uh, with, because in Italy, you can, you can continue even without money. Uh, but if you have money to make your research is another situation. She can't continue without money because her family needs her to work, needs her to, to, to bring something at home. So she uh, is in her 20s and it's not possible anymore for a mother to continue to um, uh, support, in, her. In support her uh, in an economical way. And this is a big thing in Italy, because if you don't have money from your family, it's really difficult for you to continue uh, in, a, in, in the university, in particular in philosophy, in literature, in historical studies, in anthropology, in, uh, in, in all these fields, it's so difficult for you to, to, to find a work, to, to work in the university if you don't have the support by the family. Um, and, 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 and this is the situation for Gaia. Uh, she's in a breaking point. She, uh, in, in a sliding doors, if you want to, uh, she, need, she needs to decide if she wants to continue at any cost, if, you, if she wants to study without money. But somehow it's not possible because in the few few months later they need to get her their house back. They need to go back to Rome. Uh, they need to fight for their house again, and and she needs to work. This is how it works for some for a lot of family. At some point you need to work. You can't just continue study, study, study in, for the eternity. But I have a comment to make, but before I do that, I would like to invite people to put questions in the chat or in the Q&A. I don't see any in the Q&A now. Um, I do see um, many people saying they can't wait to read the book. And um, um, but if you have some questions, uh, please, um, please ask them. One of the things that was interesting to me, and again, it's it goes to your point about her being oblivious to what's going on in the world she seems to have no concept that she could go abroad she never once makes any expresses any desire to go study in england or in france or in germany she's like or the united states the idea of looking for a scholarship or but she's completely anchored to her little reality and the kind of studying she does has not connected her to the rest of the world. I think that in Italy, we are really anchored in our little places. I, this, is, this is something that I, I really think. It's not easy for uh, an Italian young girl or young boy to just decide to go outside. Um, but in this case, she somehow all during during the novel, she she's criticizing everything about her mother, about her friends, about her school, about herself. But somehow she can she just can't get out. She just can find another way. She can just look around her. And I decided this for this character because she's really and strictly really. Mm, individual she's really looking at her shoes like we say in Italy she's just looking at herself at her little things and she's not looking around uh, and so she's like um, in a prison uh, which is her family which is herself uh, and this is why 
she the world is outside and maybe you can just go she can just say goodbye to her family and decide to work um, uh, in England or in France or in Spain uh, and and find something else out there. But somehow she's like a lot of young people that I met in the past that are just like me. They are just fully and completely um, in Italy, in this place, in this house, in this family, and they just can get out. This is you know, it, it, what you're saying. It, it's it's absolutely so true. Because, but but so much more true for a woman because Mariano, and and I do think that there's a he see he is able to see himself as existing outside of the family. In fact, he leaves. But she is really anchored to the vision of her mother she is constrained in a certain sense um by 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 gender from that point of view and maybe by her red hair i couldn't help but think of rosso malpelo yeah and, of course <laughs> and that we we're already dealing with somebody who's doomed in a certain i sense. don't know if it's the same in the united states but in italy there is this big thing about red hair um so the, the the superstitions connected with it are far stronger in italy than there are here there are a lot more redheads here of course there are some questions and um um uh, with so many comments about people wanting to uh read the book um one of the questions that i know it's one of the topics we wanted to discuss is will there be an english translation and when and maybe we can talk a little bit about uh, translation and uh, how your book is faring so far in the translation market? Uh, my book will be published in 20 countries. Um, so all around Europe, in like in German, in, in, in France, in Spain, in Portugal, in Holland, uh, in Greece, um, and then in Japan, in China. Uh, in Brazil, but it's not going to be translated in in England and in, in the United States. So there is not right yet. now, <laughs> not yet. Uh, there isn't um, a, um, an interest from from uh, a United from the United States in English. I don't in England. I don't know why because it's is one of the, I would it will be one of the most important uh, translation for me of course because it's the only other language that I know even if I don't know it in a, in a very perfect way but but um, I hope for it I don't know why uh, they told me that the um, English market is close it, it's a little bit um, slower than the other markets and maybe in the future maybe the next year but right now no one of my books uh, is going to be published in English uh, so uh, it will be published in a lot of other languages in and it will be on on in Brazil and in Mexico, uh, but not in the United States, States for right now. Well, I don't know. I don't know the what we can, We're going to see what we can do about that because if there's a book that should be published for the English language markets, whether it's um, uh, Great Britain, Australia, uh, or you know, the United States and Canada, um, it, it is your book. So um, I, I think that um, it's 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 really, but it's true that it's a book. I mean, is it true that, you know, American audiences want feel good books? It's it, it's not it's not a feel good book. It's a book that makes you think. Um, but there's certainly a history of those books, too. And I'm thinking of uh, a book that reminded me a lot of yours, which is a book called uh, White Oleanders um, by uh, Janet Fitch. I don't know if you're aware of the book. Um, it, it, it reminded me very much. Um, there's a, a mother and a daughter and the daughter who extracts poison from the white oleander. Anyway, I, it's also a book um, set in L.A., set very close to where I'm from. And I found I don't this. Know. They, they, they told me that maybe Greece, Portugal, are similar, Spain are countries that are really similar to Italy somehow. And, uh, and they told me that a lot of uh, um, 
country like China and Japan and Korea, they were talking about my book as a, a parasite book, like the movie. Uh, on the same kind of um, of themes and suggestion and things like that. And I was thinking, yeah, there is something about that. So uh, maybe this is why all these countries decided to, uh, to publish uh, the novel, but I hope, uh, I hope for the future. Well, and if you look at the reception, uh, if you look at the reception of Parasite, if you look at the reception of something like uh, Squid Game, and you know, you know, I, I was also struck by the the role of, of of children's games in your book you look at you look at that a lot then this would be seem like this is a logical book to translate i see there's an interesting question here um, um about uh, uh from a, a former student of mine actually um curious about why quotation marks were not used in the Italian in the Italian version of the novel, she says she's enjoying your book very much. And I that's a, thank you, Angela, for asking that. I have the same question myself, but I'd have to keep going back and go. Oh wait a minute, this is a quote, but I had to hear the quote. Yeah, I decided this kind of um, of style uh, with my first book. This was because um, the Grande A was uh, about. Africa, about Ethiopia and Eritrea, and about uh, Italian people over there. And they were not talking in Italian. They were not talking in English or in French. They were talking uh, in a new kind of language, which was a mix of French and English and, uh, uh, and Italian and all the dialects, Italian dialects and things like that. So I was thinking, if I put the question uh, the, the dialogue marks, uh, I'm, I'm going to betray this uh, mixture of languages in Africa. So this is why my first, I decided this for my first book. And then the second book arrived and, uh, and I was, uh, and, and that was in Le Marche uh, at the beginning of the last century. And I was like, how can I, translate this in, in, in a current Italian uh, and not be betray them too. So I was like, okay, I'm not going to put uh, the dialogue marks uh, even in this book. And then this book came out and I was like, I don't know, maybe I don't need them. Maybe I can just put uh, the words outside because I, about this book, I was thinking that this is, everything is, is just, from Gaia, she's our high in the book. And she's talking uh, as a river about her story, about dialogues, about her family, about everything. She's, she, everything passes through her. So at some point, uh, I decided not, not to put them in the book uh, because I'm so used to not to use them that I have to remind myself to put them if I have to. So somehow this is, uh, or my, um, it, it's a thing of mine, I think. Very interesting. Well, I have an, another question for you, um, which is about one of the things that, that, that struck me about Gaia was that her, her tolerance of um, those who were, living and working in, in Italy from other countries. She displayed no bias or prejudice. She comments on the Polish, the Romanians, um, the Albanians, and but I did notice that there was no mention of um, Africans. And I was wondering why, so all of these Group, ethnic groups are eventually blending in visually. But I was struck by the fact that she didn't mention Senegalese or Ghanaians. And why is that? This is why, because when I was younger and when I was a child, uh, obviously racism was really strong in Italy like it is right now. Uh, but right now we are focused uh, 
uh, on uh, African people. But 10 years ago, we were focused on uh, uh, people from Albania and from Polony and from Roma uh, Romania. 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 Uh, and I remember all these kind of creepy stories about uh, Polish people that they will rape us, uh, they will kidnap us, they will be outside, outside uh, of our schools uh, and they will bring us to their country and they will sell us. There was all these nonsense stories that were full of racism and racism was inside these stories and 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 every time there was a, um i don't know a murder or uh, or something like that everybody was like oh it was a a, a, a man from Polony. oh it was a man from romania and uh, and at some point all these people that stayed in Italy and worked in Italy, they just became Italians right now. They're Italians. They're here from 10, 20 years. And at some point, this angry, this um, sad vision of the world um, arrived on the shoulders of the African people. I remember when I was young that everybody told me that um, a black man was a good man. Like they're here in peace. I remember this as, as was yesterday. They, they, they are not drunk. They do not steal. Uh, they just work. They just sell little things. They're good men and good women. At some point, politics and racism and time, they just decided that all these people are the new po uh, people from Poland and Romania. And I remember the switch really clear, clearly, and uh, and it happens during those years. Uh, yeah, that's with... a, that. I was thinking that that's exactly what that you were actually portraying because I remember those years when they were the demonized people. And you're right. Then there's just there's a switch. And it's, it's very dramatic and it's very important, but it could be a surprise to somebody reading the book who's not aware of how um, in those decades, how they are the people who are demonized and it's not yet the Africans who are seen as a, uh, a, 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 as, as a peaceful uh, presence in Italy. There is a question here. We have two more minutes and I'd like to ask it so that you might answer in the time that's left to us. Um, and the question, is uh, that, that you said during the conversation that young Italians nowadays have no desire to move out of Italy. The, the person asking the question says, this is a little bit of a surprise to me. If possible, I would like to hear a little bit more uh, about this from Julia. Yeah, I think it's, a, it's, it's, it's com complex to explain. I don't think that a lot of people don't want to go outside. I think that the majority of people in Italy, young people are really, um, uh, in, a, in a really strict relationship with their country and their family. We are really family people. Uh, and this is really different from the north part of Europe. Uh, when they are 18, they just go outside in other countries to study uh, and to live outside. We are really, really connected to our country and our family. But if you ask them, they are going to say to you in the majority of cases that they don't like Italy as it is, that they want to go outside, that everything in Europe is better, that we don't have jobs and everything like that. So it's really a difficult, complex relationship uh, with our country and our desires. But there are a lot of young people that are going outside, that are going in Europe and in, in the United States, of course. I think that the majority has this this really deep connection that is so difficult to, to move. Uh, this is why I was talking about that, but I think it's a really complex theme. So I don't want to, to say it so sim simply, but I hope you understand what I, what I was thinking. 
Yeah, it, it's a it's an incredibly complex theme, and um, there there would certainly be a lot to say about it. But the, the what you're saying about um, um, about about family uh, and the, the 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 relationships, and ultimately that is what how the book ends with the family um, back together. And uh, that's certainly a comment on that. Um, we are unfortunately out of time. Um, there's so many more things I'd like to talk to you about. Uh, the, the, the absence of religion, uh, for example, which was another incredible theme, but I think we'll leave those for another time and another conversation. I'm very pleased to see from all the comments that many, many people are um, um, thrilled about the book that, you're, that, you're, that they're already reading or their desire to read it in English translation. Thank you so much, Julia, and thank you, Valeria, for hosting this wonderful talk. Thank you, Clorinda. Thank you, Valeria. And thank you, everybody. I, I hope I, I do it well. Thank you so much. I'm so sorry we have to wrap up now because time is limited, unfortunately. And just this very last question uh, would take, I think, at least another, another <laughs> presentation. So maybe we might invite again Julia in the future to talk more about her book once you know, uh, we hopefully will be translated into English too, but for the ones who can read and, you know, this is the week of the Italian language as well, but we try, you know, and have as many events as we can in English so that everyone can follow us and can understand. But if you can read Italian, you will find the book, uh, Libreria Pino and Rizzoli to, uh, you know, they, they carry it in Italian for now, but um, hopefully will be uh, translated soon. So I would like to thank Julia Caminito once again for this truly, truly inspiring presentation. And uh, by the way, this is our first presentation in the West Coast on the occasion of the Italian Language Week in the World. And thanks again to Campiello Price that gave us this wonderful opportunity. And of course, to our great moderator um, with our very insightful you know, questions and uh, she, she, she read the book and she, she found very deep thoughts and further inspiration, Professor Clorinda Donato. And thank you all, of course, for attending. The Italian Cultural Institute in Los Angeles not only promotes Italian language, but also Italian culture in all its forms in Southern California and in the Southwest of the United States through language program and cultural events as part of the Italian Ministry of Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation. The Institute offers courses and events organized also with numerous local, cultural, and academic institutions with the goal of presenting Italy's cultural richness in architecture, cinema, design, literature, music, poetry, science, technology, theater, and the visual arts. In an effort to continue offering a rich program during the pandemic, the Institute has been organizing webinars and online events, which are also posted on our YouTube channel. Don't miss our online webinar next week on November the 4th at two o'clock. Italian Fashion for a Coast, the Franca Suzani Fund for Preventative Genomics, featuring Dr. and our professor Robert Green and filmmaker Francesco Carrozzini, who will share his story and inspiration for the fun dedicated to his mother and late editor of Vogue Italia, Franca Sozzani. Please follow us on our social media channels, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, for daily posts on Italian culture and Italy, and also for information about our upcoming events. Again, thank you all for attending. Grazie e arrivederci.